for those who have been roped into Get this uh, haphazardly, I should warn you, this is going to be a lot of me talking. Uh, if that's not your thing, I'd recommend you run away now. But uh, if you are interested in squad leading, and mainly how F you do squad leading, you can stick around and see if anything I spout sticks, you know. I'll be uh, hurling a bunch of concepts at the wall here and hope that something, some of it sticks. The, uh, yeah. What's that thing, wait? Fling enough mud to the wall and something's gonna bound to stick. Yes, indeed. Uh, since I do know that we have some few, a few new members in the outfit attending today, uh, I'm going to put play, say this as though you've been in other outfits, because I assume, I assume many of you have. Uh, if you've joined FU, I also assume that you've probably noticed that we do things a little bit differently when we're on platoons uh, compared to many other platoon, uh, outfits. We uh, run a specific structure with a platoon leader that delegates work or responsibility to squad leaders who in turn control their squads on the battlefield. Uh, we also do lines, as I see almost all of you have just automatically made one, which we can cover as well, why, you may, why we do the lines and whatnot. Uh, but to begin at the... Uh, I believe, Mordis, you'll have to correct me if I'm using the term wrong, the meta level of uh, squad leadership or leadership in FU. Uh, we, we adhere to a specific ethos that Mordis is very keen on elaborating on further, but he has specifically uh, asked me not to ask him to uh, elaborate because then we will be here all night. So uh, I'm going to keep it really short. Uh, in terms of squad leading in FU and leading in FU in general, there's one particular thing that I take out of the ethos that I think is super important, and that is that when you step up to squad lead, or lead anything in FU, you are providing a service for everyone else in the community. You step up to take the responsibility to make sure that everybody else has fun. You make sure that everything works pro properly. You're doing a lot just by stepping up to be a volunteer as a squad leader. And uh, doing so, you should know that first, we appreciate you quite a bit for doing so. But also, second, know that it's not expected of you. Uh, there is a thing that can happen that many of the leaders here tonight will probably recognize where you are you tired, channel. you are exhausted, welcome, uh, and you just can't lead anymore. But there's nobody else who wants to step up. Uh, one of the things we do in FU, or rather the thing we do in FU at that point, is that we close the squad down. If we have a squad leader who's retiring and we have nobody replacing him, he, he disbands the squad. And the reason for this is if you don't uh, disband the squad, you kind of get trapped in this uh, never-ending uh, death trap or uh, spiral where you can't really stop leading because then no, no one steps up. So to avoid that, you need to know that, you know, as a leader, you are well within your rights to just go, I don't want to lead anymore, I'm leaving now. Now somebody step up or I'm disbanding. And then if nobody steps up, you just bounce. Simple as. There won't be any hard feelings from the community for doing so. It's expected of you to do it. Never just leave a squad to be, you know, it can take care of itself. You don't, don't do that. Because then it will just devolve into a 3 a.m. casual squad that th maybe throws off a waypoint and then it will be listed in the public uh, squad finder in the morning. And a bunch of people that are in FU will be running around with the FU squad tag. So try not to do that. But on to more practical stuff, like uh, what the squad leader and the platoon leader does. Uh, I think Mortis may have covered this in the uh, intro module a tiny bit, where he probably asked you new people at least. If the platoon leader gives an order and the squad leader gives an order, which one do you follow? Squad leader. Yes, squad leader. No one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no one. Okay. <laughs> Somebody missed the pat didn't pass the test. Out. Oh, well. You demand yeah. a trial by combat between platoon and squad leader. Yes. Uh, he, I'm sure he told you the reason for this, but I'll repeat it nonetheless for the benefit of Mortis' stream. Hello, everybody watching. Hi, I'm famous now. It is that the squad leader has a tactical overview of the situation on the field. He knows that if I stay with my squad for an additional 20 seconds, I can kill the Sunday and end the fight permanently rather than pulling out immediately and so on. And then it is up to the squad leader to make that call. Do I listen to the platoon leader now or do I listen to him soon? But uh, you. When, when you are squad leading in FU, I'm, uh, I've been told before by people, and I remember that when I started squad leading, it was difficult to really know, like, what am I supposed to do as a squad leader? Uh, what, is, what is expected of me? And, uh, well, me as a very experienced squad leader, I, I feel like it's not that much. But we, we'll see how much it is after all this. 
some of the things that you need to do as a squad leader is to keep your platoon leader updated on what's going on. Uh, if you've listened to Gisbert or anyone else like that, they tend to give updates. So if the platoon leader says, uh, go with a galaxy to platoon waypoint, an experienced squad leader usually calls out and goes, yeah, Rob is on, on a platoon waypoint. This way you keep constantly updating your platoon leader so he knows what's going on. You don't need to tell them, like, okay, Alpha's pushing uh, A point now, Alpha is, uh, clear, has cleared the point, yada, yada. They don't really need to know that much but just that you need new orders, essentially. If you clear the base, you can just go yeah, Alpha here, or Alpha to platoon. You wait for him to respond, of course, and there you go. Alpha's cleared the base, requesting new orders. You keep updating them so that there's no downtime, because when you're uh, subservient, or when you're under a uh, platoon leader, you are. he needs to know when he should be sending you on to something else, because you won't be taking that initiative yourself, usually. Morale. Uh, let me do a little bit of role-playing here for you, User just to simulate my point, yeah? Uh, I'm a platoon leader, I'm your platoon leader, we are going to Azimir. And this is how I start things. Fuck! Not this fucking shit continent again. I... Oh my god. Okay, what... Right. Everybody, get get in the galaxies. Get, get in the galaxies, get to platoon waypoint. We'll fucking pop dump this containment site, I guess. It's the fucking point, though. We're just going to get Max crashed by NC fucking pussy ma piece of shit shotgun Maxes. Let's go. Now, if I sound like this and I'm a platoon leader, I, I would say that something I've noticed when I'm attending other platoons in this game, when this happens, cohesion starts to drop pretty quickly. Because if the platoon leader, or if in this case the squad leader or the leader, is not having a good time, why would you follow him you know he does he doesn't see either he doesn't know what he's doing or he's simply not enjoying himself so why even bother to me at least something i notice with myself do when I, what i do is that when when my squad leader isn't enjoying himself and i notice i kind of drift away from it and eventually you start losing members because of this as well or rather squad members so to speak something i think many squad leaders should keep in mind as well uh to use myself as an example, if you've ever been in my platoons or my squads, I tend to kind of... It's a, it's a conscious effort that I put in to constantly try and find something positive to mention or, or to show that I'm kind of enjoying myself. I'm not saying that to say that like I'm actively trying to manipulate people or anything. It's, a, it's more of a thing like you need to focus on the positives because we're all trying to have fun, yeah? That's why we're playing a video game. If you're not enjoying yourself, why bother leading in the first place? And if you can convey that joy when you're leading something, and on top of that, if you manage to succeed and win while doing so, I've noticed at least that cohesion gets a lot stronger from it. Uh, and naturally, when I talk about cohesion in squads, that means that squad members are following you. They're doing what you're telling them to do. They're not drifting off to the other side of the map or, in some cases, just not following you in the battlefield. They're running off, you know, you're going left, they're going right, and so on. And if you're not enjoying yourself, they tend to go more right when you go left, because, yeah, you, things just don't work out. Something to keep in mind, I think. Try and maintain morale. Enjoy yourself, and show others that you're enjoying yourself, and usually people will be starting to catch up. Uh, now, let's dig into some more nitty-gritty things, I think. Uh, like I said earlier, a few does lines and whatnot, and we try to maintain, or at least I think we used to, I don't know if we do these days, but a good thing to try and keep in mind when you're squad leading is squad composition. I'm sure you've heard those that term before when we're set, reset back to a warp game where we're all lined up. Squad composition is basically you want to get as much uh, effect out of your 12 members as you can. And if you have 12 infiltrators, you you can probably have some fun, but in a big fight, or in a small fight for that matter, you might not be able to be as effective as you would if you had a more balanced composition. Uh, a standard FU squad composition should be five medics, five heavies, one infill, and one NG. The heavies provide the uh, fire support, they've got rockets, they can shoot maxes, they can shoot tanks, they can lay down a shitload of fire if they've got the right gun. Medics naturally keep everybody alive, keep everybody going. They're, ba they're usually the backbone of any squad. They are what you keep you alive. So always make sure you have at least five medics, I would say, if you're squad leader. 
Infiltrator is mainly there just to give you recon. Use the recon dots, the, the dildar, anything that the squad leader can use to basically read the map and know when the enemy is coming and where they're coming from. And an engineer to give ammunition. That's about it, really. But he can also shoot people. That's right. Another point there to make is light assaults. I personally don't allow that light assaults in my squads because light assaults have a tendency to get tunnel vision and run the fuck off to the other side of the base, chasing the kill and the flank and whatnot. And usually, it doesn't really help the squad as a whole. I guess that's more of a personal preference, but uh, I would say try, try and do that if you're new to squad leading as well. Keep light assaults away because you will lose cohesion just by having them there, unless you're doing a full light assault squad, of course. Uh, logistics is another point. In FU, squad, first of all, we don't do leaderless squads. I've already covered that bit. But another thing that we do that you may have noticed is that squad leaders never pull galaxies. The reason for this is that the squad leader is responsible for the tactical control of the battle that you're going to. If he's busy trying to not fly into a tree, he's not going to be able to read the base. So if let's use an example in game, right? I am the squad leader, and I'm going. I'm being told to go attack uh, Genodyne Holographics, or defend Genodyne Holographics on the two waypoint. Uh, I pull the galaxy and I start flying. Right now, it's 12 to 24 NC. We are popping them pretty badly. We're not really needed there. But this game, things change so quickly that in 20 seconds, it could be a 96 plus NC horde waiting for me when I drop there. If I'm flying, I can't. I can't see that unless I'm flying straight and very slowly and whatnot. This is why the squad leader is never flying, because when he, when we are flying right now, if we're in the galaxy, what I, am as a squad leader, am doing is I'm looking at the base. I'll figure out, right, okay, where's the point? There are three points on this base. I want to drop this on the platoon waypoint. That's probably the A point. Uh, I know that this has about four doors. One of them is over here on new platoon waypoint. I want us all to drop in there, and I want to drop a beacon on the roof when we drop in. All of these things are going through my mind when I'm, as a squad leader, just sitting in the galaxy. Because I've got a logistics member focusing on flying. Perfect. If I didn't, if I was flying, I wouldn't be able to do any of this. would just drop in and probably get absolutely fucked or land in a ghost cap or whatever. That is why squad leaders do not pull galaxies. I know some people can uh, cheat a bit and pull a Valkyries and whatnot when it's really, you know, low on time or whatnot. And yeah, it's, it's all right to do it sometimes. Generally try and not pull galaxies when you're the squad leader. Uh, instead, what you do when we're at the warp gate, or any, any place really, if the platoon leader calls for a galaxy, you as a squad leader, you ask the question. I need a galaxy for Alpha, let's say we're Alpha. I need a, squad, a, a galaxy for Alpha. Who can pull me one? And you do not let... If nobody responds, you wait. This can get a bit uh, stressful for some people, especially if they're new at squad leading. Uh, you just wait. If nobody replies, you go, oh, okay, well, I guess we're just staying here at the walk gate then, standing in this uh, boring line while the fight ends, because nobody's pulling me a galaxy. Usually somebody steps up. There, it's, it's probably unheard of for me, at least, that nobody steps up ever. Eventually, one or even two people just pull the galaxy because they get so bored and they just stand around. Because again, this uh, again has to do with the providing a service thing that I covered at the very start. If you allow your squad to just use you, if you signal Easy to them to that you give channel. them an order and they Easy don't follow you, they just have to wait and you'll go back on that order anyway, right? You want to bind your own authority if you just pull the galaxy yourself. So you just stand there and wait. Even if the platoon leader is calling for you, you just tell him. Uh, Alpha can't move up because nobody's pulling a galaxy because then you add a little bit of uh, public shaming there as well. Something I'm a fan of, at least. Don't know if it's the thing I should be preaching, though, Mortis. No comment. <laughs> uh, that basically covers logistics, and this is the same with any sort of... Uh, or, well, no, it's not really the same. You can, as a squad leader, place a beacon, for example, but here's another thing with uh, resource management that you need to keep in mind as a squad leader. Squad beacons is a resource that you need to manage as a squad leader. Because it has a 300 second cooldown, and if four people place a beacon at once, you immediately lose, what, two minutes of uh, worth when it comes to uh, beacons. It's a massive waste. So what you should be doing with any sort of resource, really, galaxies, uh, rep sundies, maxes, beacons, you go as a squad leader, you say it, I need a, I need a, I need a beacon, who can place me one for alpha? 
And here we go back to the SOPs that I'm sure uh, Maud has covered in the intro module as well. Uh, you basically wait for confirmation before you place them anything. So if I as a squad leader ask, uh, for example, Mortis, or if I do, let's say Mortis, you'll be my partner for this one. I as a squad leader go, I need a galaxy for it, or I need a beacon for Alpha. Who can put me one? Put, put, put one down. down. Mortis, galaxy. Thank you, Mortis, or beacon. We wait for the confirmation, because otherwise Mortis is going to place a beacon, and then Defranovsky is going to place a beacon, and we've wasted two. Not the end of the world if this happens. Same with the galaxy. If two people pull, eh. It's not like it'll be back in two minutes, but it's just a thing to keep in mind. Try and manage your resources, because especially beacons, the longer you can keep a beacon alive or keep cycling beacons, the longer you stay in a fight, especially now that the beacons have been buffed to shit. So, you know, keep them in mind. Mm. All, all of this ties into the fact that we want to foster player initiative in FU, whether it's beacon, squad leadership or, uh, or pulling galaxies. It's a very important that we delegate the different roles and tasks in the game and that we foster initiative, which naturally also fosters leadership and engagement with the players. It tends to have that effect, yeah. <laughs> which is good, which is very good. Right, next part. Uh, Skeletron is not here to fill me in on it particularly well, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, a tip or a uh, method that we've been trying to roll out in FU for a bit now is the concept of an EXO or a Commissar. Uh, I won't really Jarvis, cover this... Get next to me. I won't really cover this idea okay. in detail right now, now. But I will underline something that we've learned from this initiative that is very useful when you're a squad leader, especially if you're a new squad leader. Uh, when you're a squad leader, you have access to five okay. waypoints. The squad, uh, the squad waypoint and the clubs, spades, hearts, and uh, what is it? Spades. Basically, four fire team lead waypoints. If you have four people, or let's just say one pe person in your squad that is helping you, that is uh, vocal, that is talking to you, you know, if you say, "Everybody on me, let's spawn in this spawn room," uh, and then Taywe goes, "I'm right with you, boss." Taywe is a natural commissar or a, an EXO. You, you you should throw a fire team lead at a, this sort of player because they will automatically be helping you. They will be going, uh, uh, you know, uh, deployed enemy Sunday on Hearts Waypoint. Boom, you already know where that Sunday is now. Okay, cool, everybody stop moving from Hearts Waypoint. You get this sort of assistant squad leader, if you will. And you, have, you can get up to four of these since you've got four fire teams. Let's pray that you have four people that are willing to talk to you like that if you do. Those squads are always the f most fucking amazing because everybody follows you and it's great. So it's a it's a thing to use. Try and use your fire team leaders. You don't need to tell give them orders and whatnot. Just give them a waypoint if they're talking, and everything else will kind of come naturally. Because when these people that are vocal are telling you that they're following you, other people that don't usually talk have a tendency to uh, start following you just automatically. Because you know if Tailway says that he. It, indicates that he trusts the squad leader, then maybe I can trust him too. And eventually you just get this nice serpentine, which I'll be covering later as well. Mortis, you wanted to pitch in? Uh, the uh, the fuel that program in, that we oh, are developing and intending to launch builds very much into what Jack is saying. So basically fuel means FU emerging leaders. So it's a catchy acronym for it. Uh, the way we we offer anybody who's interested in leadership to get in either as a squad or platoon leader directly if you want to do that will support you but like uh, Jack said uh, fire team leaders is uh, more uh, it's a lower threshold to get into so we we give it to players who, who are more vocal and want to be engaged and want to try out more than just building assets like galaxies as a fire team leader, you get your own marker that you can set, and then you can also talk to your fire team in the game. So you can have a miniature squad or miniature leadership there, if if that is what you want to try out and what you agree to do with the squad leader. So uh, fuel program is going to be both in game and it's going to go much deeper into values and methods and the, sort of the psychology behind leadership in FU. So if you're interested in participating in this program, and it will not be uh, just a lecture, it will be for probably several weeks that we will 
provide you with different smaller lessons and practices that you can try. Uh, send me a message on on uh, Discord if you want to participate in Fuel program and uh, I'll get you sorted out. So the program is almost ready to launch. We are just looking for the first participants to it. Fantastic. Now uh, to uh, invite the rest of the group here actually. Does anyone have any questions so far? No. All right, so uh, to, go, to go back to the squad leading aspect of things, um, so I've basically covered like what you should have in the back of your head when you're squad leading. That is that you are doing them a favor by being a squad leader. Never forget that, because it is that way, especially in FU. You are providing them a service. They I'm should be them. grateful in that regard. And if they're not, you owe it to yourself and to the people that uh, are actually following you and be, uh, you know, appre appreciating you to disband their squad if they're not stepping up to replace I'd, uh, I'd like to expand on that that um, when you're it. when you're leading your responsibilities towards the people that follow you so it doesn't matter if it's FE members or public players and uh, if if FE members are not listening then you know if you inform them what they should do and if they don't follow then you remove them as you would with public players so the same rule apply and it, it's important that you know your value as a leader so you don't let yourself like Jack has mentioned, so you don't create an abusive system where people just walk over you and ignore, because that will just disintegrate the playstyle and, and, you know, burn you out very quickly. That even goes for Mortis. So if Mortis is sure. not doing what you're saying, you can also kick him from the squad and you won't be in trouble. Just, you know, shoot, shoot me a, a message before you do it so I know that I'm a bad boy. Exactly. Uh, but yes, um, I'll try and explain just the entire process from start to finish as a squad leader when you're in a platoon or just if you're setting out from the warp gate, right? If you're leading an FU style squad. First thing you do, obviously, as I've covered, is that you line up at the warp gate. Nice, neat line. You balance out your squad. You make sure that everybody's with you. If they're not responding to you when you've reset back to the warp gate, give them a warning. It takes 10 seconds to redeploy and it's instant to redeploy at the warp gate. So it should take them no less than 15 to 20 seconds to get back to the warp gate. Give them fair warning and just go, hey, I'm resetting my toolkit. If you don't follow me, I'm going to be removing you. No hard feelings. And then remove them, F you, officer or not. Uh, what you do then is you ask for a galaxy. You wait for somebody to pull a galaxy. Depending on if you have Maxis or not, you can land or you can simply redeploy to the galaxy and get moving. A tip here as a squad leader is that if you're moving out from the warp gate and you're not really sure where to go, Something that you need to avoid when you're leading is silence. Because silence is the uh, fun killer or cohesion killer. If there's silence and nobody's doing anything, people just assume that things are quieting down and they either go find something more fun to do or they just log off. So you need to keep things rolling, keep momentum going. And a way for you to do this when you're squad leading, if you're setting up for the walk in a galaxy and you don't know where to go. So right now, let's say I, I don't see a decent fight. I'm seeing a couple of uh, explosions on the map, heat markers towards the NC. So I'm going to place a waypoint on platoon waypoint and go, Galaxy, move out to platoon waypoint. Because now the Galaxy is moving somewhere. All the squad members can see that you're moving. You're on your way to something. They don't know what. You don't know what. But now you have time to look. And you can see, OK, well, what do we have? We have Genodyne Holographics, 12 to 24, and we have Wainwright, uh, 24 to 48. All right, well, we're one squad, so I think Genodyne Holographics would be good for us. So let's move on to Platoon Waypoint and Genodyne. Now you're still flying, and since you aren't the one operating the galaxy, you can look at the map. And this is what you do as a squad leader then. You zoom in on the base. You look at the population. It's 76 to 24, or 80 to 20 now. A good rule of thumb when you're selecting a fight is to... You, you don't want to tip the scale of, of the population in either factions favor too much because then otherwise either it's going to be a serg for your from your end or it's going to be a serg from the nc or the enemy uh, the good rule of thumb is basically 60 40 percent 60 percent attacker 40 percent defender if the fight is tipped in either way there let's say that it's 30 percent defender and 70 percent attacker you can send your squad there without an issue you'll probably have a great time because you'll be slightly out of but you have the defender's advantage and so it'll be a pretty decent fight this doesn't really apply as well if it's a 96 plus because 12 people in a 96 plus doesn't really make that much of a difference. So you don't need to worry about the pop too much either. 
And in FU, we try and avoid surging if we can. We want to have a fun fight. Even we need, we even want the enemies to have a fun fight because otherwise we're going to start losing enemies. And then we want to have people to shoot in the long run. So you want to try and keep things fairly balanced as a squad leader, whereas a platoon leader in this case. But let's go back to the squad leader. We're going to Genodyne Holographics and we're defending it. So what do you need to consider here? Well, you first need to figure out where you want to drop. This comes with a lot of experience just on the basis you'll figure out where the, the points are. But in this case, I can mark them for us. Platoon Waypoint, Alpha Waypoint, and Barabba Waypoint are the points. Uh, so I'm going to pick one of these. I prefer Platoon Waypoint, so let's drop on that. Same as I did before. I know that there's a door to the north, so we're going to drop on that. Now, we are flying in a galaxy. We're about to drop, but we have two things left to do. We need to figure out if we're going to keep or dip the galaxy, because otherwise the pilot's going to be very confused. So you decide, do you want to keep the galaxy? Are you moving elsewhere? Do you want to use the galaxy for fire support? Up to you. Or do you want the guy on the ground with you? Then you just ditch and you leave the galaxy. It's fine. Uh, and the second thing is you want a beacon. And here you can ask the squad, all right, guys, when we land, I need a beacon. Who can, who can drop me one? Okay, nobody wants to place it. I'll place it then. Fine. All right. So you land. You drop the beacon. Boom. Now you're all on platoon waypoint. You go, okay, everybody jump down. Push in, push in, push in. That is basically the process that you go through as a squad leader in FU, from start to finish, from the warp gate to where you land in the base, or wherever you pull from. Uh, it's not more complicated than that, really, I think. But then we get to more interesting things like, what do you do when you land? This can vary greatly, and I'm not going to spend time telling you specific tactics on how to deal with things, because there's way too many circumstances in this game that will change that how you approach things. So I can't tell you to bring that specific rocket launcher or that specific grenade, because I have no fucking idea what's going to happen when we land. But instead, what I can tell you is a concept that I slightly updated from my end, but I still keep calling it that, because I still like the idea of it. And it's something called SRA. It stands for Secure Rally in Advance. And the concept, the TLDR version, I would say, is that the squad should always stick with their squad leader from the, le from the moment they exit the galaxy or spawn in to the moment that they redeploy out. They should never be further than a grenade's throw away from their squad leader. And the reason that we do this is basically in the SRA concept. It is that you spawn in on, let's say, a Sunday. You spawn in on the Sunday. You secure the Sunday. You make sure that it's safe, nobody's killing it, you repair it if you need it. You rally, you group up with the entire squad, you're all in a group, and then you advance as a group, all 12 of you. Because what I usually use as an argument here to say why you should do this is that I'm sure most of you have had a occasion in any FPS game where you get a flank and you get behind like six dudes and you shoot three of them in the back before they even notice you're there. And you feel so fucking good about yourself. Like, holy shit, I just killed three people. They didn't even know it was there. If you do that with 12 people, you can kill entire platoons. If you do that with 12 people, you can win battles in the span of like five seconds if you get a decent enough flank. You always want to keep your squad with you. They need to move with you. They need to act with you. They need to shoot with you, preferably not at you unless you're running too far ahead. Take some ammunition. It's a very strong thing to keep in mind. Always try and keep, even if you don't know what you're doing, if, you, if you're spawning in on a base and you're massively overpopped and you don't know what the fuck's going on or how you're going to break this, still rally everybody up. Because if, if you're going to do anything, just do it together and you'll succeed at it slightly more than you would if you were alone. So always, always, always rally up your squad. Keep them with you. And if you do this and you succeed... Your cohesion really improves, or your cohesion is good from the beginning. And I can tell you, as a platoon leader at least, this is how I gauge how successful and how fun a squad is to be in. If I look at the map and I see the squad leader, the star, moving, and I see a serpentine of squad members moving behind that squad leader, I know that they're having a good time. Because the squad, squad members are listening to the squad leader. The squad leader is achieving something. It might not be big, they might even get wrecked completely several times over. But at least they're having fun. That's uh, something you should always try and strive for when you're squad leading. Always try and keep your squad with you. And if you're not squad leading, always try and stay near your fucking squad leader. Because, goddamn, if he has to work for that, it gets very tiring. I, I can tell you that much. Now, that is a concept that you should apply at all times, basically, as a squad leader. 
Another tip as a squad leader it plays into the role of the infiltrator that you will have, the one infiltrator. And that is if you are not redeployed right now, if you hit H should be your standard key, you can open up, you can expand your minimap on the screen. And this tells you a few things. Uh, first of all, it gives you more of a range so you can see things on the map. But most importantly, you see right now there's a big red bar that says 100%. That is the population counter or population balance indicator. You can use this as a squad leader to basically run around on the base and do whatever you want and shoot some mans. But you can also tell them. You can tell when an enemy spawns in because suddenly it goes from, let's say, 60-40, uh, so 60% NC, 40% TR. Suddenly it bumps up to 85% NC. Then you know the second that the NC spawn in, basically, as soon as it updates, you know that somebody spawned in. And just based on the gigantic pop, you can probably guess that it's either organized or a big fight's just ended. Regardless, you're about to be pushed by a lot of enemies. You immediately have a sense of, there's something coming. I need to get ready now. And then you can use the infiltrator, because hopefully he's got a bunch of recon out. And then you can see the line of NC covered out of the spawn room 20 seconds before they arrive. You can start yelling at your squad members, not yelling, but telling your squad members to, okay, get to this door. They're coming through this door. Let's go. Chuck mates at that door. Boom, you can stop them in the tracks. You can stop the max crash before they even push in through the door. So use the minimap. Use the population counter. Always stay on top of what's going on in the hex that you're fighting in on that big scale, so to speak, because it gives you a very good warning of what's coming. Sometimes you can't stop it, but at least you'll make a bigger dent than you would if you uh, didn't see it coming. Uh, and lastly, I did add this at the very end, but I'll do it to help Delta out as well. We have a term in FU called the escort playstyle. And it's not what we talked about in the uh, Alcoholics channel earlier about escorts. It's about a playstyle in FU. And it is basically that there, there's this idea, or I would say automatic behavior of most players in this game, that you spawn in a base and you go to the point. Because all the enemies are on the point. And this base, is, this game is about capturing bases, so you've got to go to the point, right? The escort playstyle steps away from that, in a sense. It is... Let's, uh, let's see if I can use a map as an example here. Do we have any good base that I can use that people fight over often? Nascence Defiance? Yes, that's the one. Yeah, that actually works. Okay, so, the two ways. Middle. Nascent defines middle of the map. Let's say that we're attacking this, and we are attacking from the north on Alpha Waypoint. And we are currently inside the platoon waypoint. At the very bottom, there's a C point, and it's a big clusterfuck in there. But we're in there, and we get pushed off the base by a NC max crash. Fifteen fucking uh, hacks or maxes show up and butcher us in a split second. What most people do, including myself, we look at that big max crash and we go, well, we can't deal with that. Uh, we need to redeploy out this fight server. That's not necessarily what you need to do in this case. Because, right, sure, you're, you've been pushed off the point, and you don't really want to push the point again. Because there's 15 NC maxes waiting for you. That's going to suck to push. What can you do then to have an effect as a squad, as 12 people in a 96-plus battle? you can have an effect by simply not going for the point, but instead making sure that everybody else can get to the point. So in this case, you would probably take your squad and you would tell them to go onto the roof of Alpha Waypoint and shoot over to the uh, wall on the main building of Nation Defiance or onto the ground when the NC is coming where the max crash out into the open. You suppress the enemy, you hurt them until they either die out in the field or they push in and get wiped by your friendlies because you, you hurt them so badly you knocked off half their health before they even got in. And then you keep covering your friendlies while they cross that open ground. And suddenly your entire faction is back inside that tunnel and they're pushing. And you stay up there. You still shoot at the NC up on the wall because now when you're standing there shooting down, the NC can't jump down and surround them in the tunnel. This is the concept of an escort play style where you don't push the point. You rather enable others to push the point. This, for one, makes sure that you don't have to push into the room and get absolutely butchered 15 times over and get rest bound. But instead, you stand out there and you have an effect. You have a notable effect on the battle. But you don't die as much, because you're standing out of the main lane of approach that I will be covering in just a second as well. People, People aren't pushing for you, because you're not in their way, but you're shooting at them when they try and get to where they're going. It creates a very stable, very effective way for you to use your squad, even in an overpop. 
I would uh, say about the Escort playstyle is it was created uh, during a time when TR had less population on the server than the other factions, so we were constantly getting out popped and just holding or pushing points was almost impossible because we got we got overrun every time by the sheer number of enemies. So it became a way for us to find uh, stable gameplay, not getting overrun immediately. We had to go in the periphery of the fight and just try to hold strategic locations like protecting the Sunderer, protecting the movement patterns of friendlies and, and just not push the point. So it, winning bases becomes secondary as Jack said. Uh, you are there to help public players or other squads that you are not connected to. You are helping them to capture the point and you're holding all the, the flanks, which then creates a different dynamic to the gameplay and maybe um, more variety to it. You can also do it in the terrain. It doesn't have to be in a base. You can set up in the terrain features, uh, chokehold on the roads. Uh, or, or something similar. So, uh, bridge fight. We had a bridge fight uh, a few days ago on Osher, which was amazing. And that was, um, well, technically you could say it was sort of an escort playstyle because we kept the bridge under control so friendly should, could push forward. So, yeah, uh, more about these things in the fuel program if you sign up for that training program. We'll take them in smaller bits and more in detail. Yeah, we used to do something similar, um, which is tank uh, armor buster squads. You plop a bunch of heavies and a couple of engines, a couple of medics somewhere obscure and just snipe armor columns as they're trying to advance. One last bit. I'm almost done here, trust me. It's uh, the last piece of this, which is actually where the name tactical layout module comes from, even though I focus more on squad leading than tactical layout today. Uh, tacti I'm just going to do a uh, display of this and if you want you can stay afterwards and you can uh, try this with me if you want I'm happy to stick around and uh, talk you through it if you want but after that after this the module will be over uh, we basically try and use a method I think this helps especially if you're a new squad leader uh, and it kind of even as an experienced squad leader it puts you into the mindset of the escort player style SRA uh, try, trying to kind of apply these concepts and that's you try and analyze a basis layout ahead of things or even you do it uh, after a while you're going to do it on the fly when you're just in the base you're going to start like knowing these things just automatically for if you've ever noticed the veteran in the in plant side somehow they always know where the sundays are even though they're not tagged and that's usually because there are only so many places on a base that a sunday can be placed and usually you can even tra track like you can see a trail of red dots coming out of it so you know when you get in on the base where it is already sometimes you even know even when you're not in the hex where the sunday is but this comes automatically, and especially if you use this sort of model. Uh, basically, we've we've used we use a bunch of concepts. For example, uh, proximity defense, uh, flanking positions, forward positions, main lanes of approach, and the like. And I'll uh, paint them for you now, so you can understand. I just need a good base. Hosen is so 3D, so it's uh, difficult for me to find a proper one. Okay, here we go. Here's a good one. The two waypoint. A car data hub. So the way you want to try and approach it is basically like this. First of all, you go at this from the perspective of an, of an attacker. You're attacking a base, and usually we only do this with one, one point bases because they're the easiest to illustrate. Uh, first thing you do is you identify the enemy spawn room, and I'm going to start to tr attempt to paint here just to show you. This is the enemy spawn room. This is where all the enemies are going to be coming in. There's also a secondary spawn with the teleporter on this square. So now we know where the enemies are going to be coming from. And the second thing we paint is where the enemy is going to be going. The point is on the what is it called? The powerhouse building, which is marked in red. This entire point. The point is upstairs actually. Now we can assume that the enemies are going to be coming through, well, it's even a road painted for us here. I'll make mark this in red, because fuck it, why not? The enemy will be coming in through these two points, mainly. They're going to be just charging out of the spawn room, trying to get to the point as quickly as humanly possible, because, you know, they want to go shoot mats. And always the enemy's on the point, right? So why wouldn't you go there? A second lane that the enemy can use is if they're clever, which 
is usually what the organized squads do, is they use the teleporter, and they go into the banana building instead, and they cross over into uh, double doors, as they're called. Because usually the enemies are watching there. They're watching the small stairs uh, where the two red lines are going, basically. So you, you can sometimes, most of the time, there's always one or, you know, a couple of dudes that are watching this door. So they're going to respond to you, but you'll get a bit of a more surprise if you go for the second door, or the second path. And you also, when you're attacking, you need to keep this in mind, that, you know, a good player is going to be coming from the north on this base. So you always want to make sure that you keep a guy at those double doors upstairs, with a microphone, hopefully, calling out, like, oh shit, one RPC is pushing here with a max now. Okay, well, now we need to go to the, that area and defend that instead. Uh, but, since we've talked about the escort play style and whatnot, sometimes you don't want to be standing on the point, because there's a shitload of maxes coming that way, and it's probably going to suck to be in there in two seconds. So, you have a couple of options here. You can still have an effect on the base. You can, effect, you can attack the base successfully, even without touching the point. You can do this by going to a so-called forward position, or a flanking position. Forward position is, uh, well, relatively self-explanatory. It's a position that puts you in between the enemy spawn and the point. Or rather, it puts you in the middle of their main lane of approach. You want to be a buffer between the enemy spawn and the point, because you want to delay them as much as possible. This usually means that you're going to die a lot, or you're going to get a shitload of kills, depending on how effective you are and how strong the enemy push is. Uh, and yeah, it's a high risk, high reward sort of thing, I guess. The forward position on this space, I would argue, is probably the blue marker. This building, the uh, teleporter building, I think, that leads into the biolab. This building is not directly in the lanes, as you can see, so it might even be a flanking position, actually. But I would say that they're probably going to go through this building first, have, uh, regardless. If you're standing here, the enemy is going to be pushing through you towards the point. And yeah, it gets nasty, but it keeps people off the uh, off the edge or off the point rather. You could also argue that this forested area that I'll mark now is a forward position. Not as much cover, but it is directly in the lane. The enemy is going through you. You either stop them or you die. The other concept that you can use is a flanking position, and a flanking position. Well, most people know what flanking is, but essentially you put yourself in a position where the enemy is not going through you. They're going past you, which means that the enemies, they're probably going to shoot back at you, but they're not going to hunt you down. They're not going to go straight at you trying to kill you because they want to get to the point, right? And this means that you'll have a lot more opportunity to shoot the enemy, to harass the enemy, to hurt them, to kill them, delay them even if you're uh, suppressing them well enough. On this particular base, a flanking position might be difficult to find. But I would probably say, I'm going to mark it in pink, because why not? Uh, the upstairs of the banana building, which is here, might be considered a flanking position. I would probably call it a forward position, because as you can see, the lane from the teleporter goes straight through it as well. Uh, if you're standing... Jack? Mm -hmm. Do you see the little building just below the left corner of the woodland uh, coloured block you did? You mean this one? Uh, no, the one on the right. Literally right next to it. That one? Yes. Would that be considered a flanking position since it's next to well, their lane? That particular thing is actually not a building, it's a vehicle pad in a sunken position, so, so that would be a very bad forward position. <laughs> okay, it looks like a building on the map because of that tree. Yeah, I know, I know. However, I would say that this building might very well be a flanking position. Because this building, you can't go through it to get to the point, but you have to go past it. So that might very well be a flanking position, because here you have a clear line of sight straight up. Let's see. Straight up where the enemy is coming from. I'm marking it in red dots so you can see that, you know, shooty mans are coming up. Bullets are coming out of this building. There you go. You can cover this entire approach from the enemy here. And they're not going straight at you. So this would be a viable flanking position for you. Your entire squad is probably not going to die for the standing in there. Well, they might, but the chance will be smaller if there's, than if they're standing on the point. Uh... And lastly, I think, we have Sunday positions. Yes. 
These can be good to paint, even though we're attacking in this hypothetical. It's good to know where your Sandys are so that you can know where your friendlies are coming from, or where you'll be coming from if you get knocked off the point, right? I'll be marking these in uh, green, shall I? Now, let's see if I remember where the Sandy positions are on this space. There is a vehicle garage, a natural rock formation, on this big green dot, or blob. There's also a path that leads up on the new green blob. And I think that's about it, because everything else is either blocked off by vehicle uh, shields or by literal mountains. So these are your two, two, two sunny positions on this base. Uh, Jack, I think there are also sunny positions inside those two entrances. There are, like, garages, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, you might be right, actually. I think there is one on uh, this tower, at least. I don't know if the, the other one has it. I think the other one is the identical. Is it? Okay, so potentially another one here. Well, I, I, I would I'm say sure these two are usually good. not the ones that are used. They are more uh, backup Sundays. When these are in use, you're usually pushed off the base anyway. But yeah, there are alternatives. So now, just to paint where the friendlies are coming up, they're coming straight out of this one, because this one is closest to the point. Right there. They're going to be running like so, these green arrows. Straight to the point, as soon as, as fast as they can. And if you get pushed off the point, and you need to get back on there, you can immediately identify a potential flanking position for you to take if you want to help your friendlies. And it would be this. Hang on. That's not right. Hang on. Uh, I'll do last, please. Okay. Let's see. Okay, that didn't quite work out the way I wanted to. This green thing. That's a decent flanking position, because suddenly you're covering this entire region, right? Like so. You're also keeping the northern side safe so that the enemies can't get into this building and flank you. And suddenly, if you manage to secure that building, you can help your friendlies from it, you can cover them, and suddenly your friendlies start pushing. It's a big human wave pushing for the point, and suddenly you're back on the point. I think this illustration works fairly well. But yeah, if you try and apply this, you can you can test this either now with me after we end the module, or you can try it on your own later. Think along these lines when you look at a base, when you're moving, when you're in the galaxy and the like. T try and think of these things. Where are the Sundays? Where can I put my squad that I will be most effective? Do I need to be exactly on the point? Let's be honest, most of the time you do. But I would honestly say that the best fights that I usually get are not on the point. They're next to the point. They're overlooking the point. They're flanking positions. Because those are the juiciest spots you'll find. You can shoot all of the enemies and they're all running away from you because they are in a hurry to the point. So I would recommend flanking positions whenever you can, unless you're needed on the point, which you very often are. But yeah, try and apply that. And uh, use SRA. Manage your beacons. Remember to step down if you get burnt out. And I would say the last thing that I... You, most of the things that I've said today... I've not always done these things. I think most of the leaders here present know that all of the things we preach are not always applied because it gets very tiring sometimes. It's okay if you don't. But one thing that I will say that you should never, ever do, that is yell at your squad members. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. Don't, don't you know, cuss at them. Don't screech. I'm sure most of you have been in a, in a platoon where the leader is yelling at people because they're not fast enough or whatever. Don't do that. Because I will be very mad, and also disappointed. I'll admit I've come very close to yelling before. Yes, and that happens. I have been extremely frustrated when leading before, and I will be in the future again. But always, if you feel the need to yell at anyone while leading, step down. Because you're not having fun then, are you? You're just angry. It's not, Nothing is fun about it. Just step down. It's okay. Ask to be replaced if nobody does it, just disband. Yes, Brubaker, if people know him, is a fantastic example and probably my inspiration for telling you that. Nobody, we're all playing this to have fun, right? You need to remember that at all times. Even when you're leading, you're doing this to have fun. And if you're not having fun, don't do it. Simple as. But we ramming, would love it if you lead. <laughs> ramming it's, this point home. Don't think that you're letting that squat down if your energy is low, but you want to keep leading because it's if you are done, you're done. You have provided your service, and if these people are frankly too lazy to step up because it affected you are tired, that's their problem, not yours. Don't, don't beat yourself up over it, and don't think yourself as 
lower than them just because of the fact that you can't keep going for hours and hours and hours. Nobody can. The fact, the fact that you've stepped up to lead in the first place puts you higher above any of the most. Oh, of the fuck yeah. That, that Just a yeah. question. Is, is Brewbreaker uh, still playing? Because I remember him from like 2016. Yeah, he's, oh, yes. he's still here? He's oh. in exile. If uh, you see if... anyone who, who see Brewbreaker, block his ass. <laughs> also, uh, if you hear anyone oh, he, he using uh, FYC is he in from Matthew. He is not from Matthew. Oh, he, was he, he was in there, man. Ah, uh, that's where I remember it from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, a personality like Brubaker wouldn't last five minutes in FU, I think. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the point about, uh, you know, uh, stepping down when you're tired is, is a very important one. Uh, I personally, about an hour usually, that's when I can keep up energy and focus, and after that it goes pretty fast downhill. It just it becomes longer and longer in between uh, orders and focus and, uh, you know, frustration. Uh, one thing I would mention, if we're still looking at the map on the picture or the lines drawn here, I don't know if how much you... Hold on. My mouse uh, is acting weird. Jack, I have yep. checked those two areas near the towers. One of them is completely inaccessible. Sunder is the other one's right next to a vehicle gate. So one of them has that and one doesn't. No, no, like one's completely inaccessible and one's got a vehicle gate on it. So it would literally just be, it's literally the direction enemy vehicles would come out of their base to get out of that base. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So not so only about how they, yeah. they, you know, you know worst case, yeah. you can use the Sunday there, but it's going to die it's pretty quickly. Yeah. And to even get Sunderers in that base, you're going to either have to drop them into an anvil or kill the uh, shield. Or oh, GS3. Oh yeah, I forget about them sometimes because you very, I very, very see those now. All right. Uh, as I was saying, um, I don't know if you mentioned this already, Jack, but I'll just make sure that it's included. Um, you see the uh, the green lines. Those are, I assume, these are the friendly movement patterns that we call yes. lane. So that's the natural flow of players from the zombies, the spawns, and the yellow ones and red ones apparently are the natural flow of, of enemy movements. Now, in a, as an escort, escort playstyle, you would essentially uh, either position yourself on the flanks or, or just hold these movement lanes uh, under control so they don't get outflanked by enemies and uh, just allow friendlies to pass you. So that's, that's one example of how you would practically apply that playstyle. Another important point to make, again, I'm not sure if I missed it or not. We all get pushed off the points now and then. We get overrun, we lose control. And the problem you run into then is that most leaders, and including myself, we, we don't really know what to do. We don't have a backup plan. We were holding the point a second ago and now suddenly, you know, it's completely out of control. Now, it's important that you're quick to decide what to do and redeploying out of the fight is not necessarily the best idea always. So try to spawn in on the Sundays you have and then don't push the point. Do not push the point. Immediately apply the escort playstyle so you're instead trying to secure the movement patterns for friendlies and halting the enemy's advance. So if you're pushing too hard to the point, you will be unstable as a group and you will die too much. But if you can gradually hold the ground and allow for friendlies to push with you, you can, surprisingly often, you can gain control of the fight and push back to the point and there will be time for reinforcement to arrive. And winning a fight after you have lost a point one or two times is much, much sweeter than just dumping the point and holding it until the time runs out. So that's that's plan B. Get that as an autonomous reaction when you get overrun on the point. Spawn back, hold the spawn, hold the movement pattern, get to the flanks, and then when you see friendlies are starting to get close to the point, you can assist them at that point. Never give up, never surrender, unless you spawn the shit, then get the hell out. Yeah, yeah, of course. Avoid <laughs> getting spawn killed or grind down. You have to use your common sense always. Uh, and also regarding leadership, we spoke about, you know, when you're tired, you should step down. 
and we talked about you know we, we don't always apply all of the, the things we're teaching here uh, it's very important to understand and if you we we run our community based on values rather than rules so we don't have a strict guideline that you have to do these things and if you don't do these things you you'll get a strike or a punishment or something like that that's not the way it's value based we try to strive for the ideals that we hold communication should be you know organized squads should be organized leadership delegated circulated leadership so that you don't burn out players take initiative etc all of that but we all make mistakes in one way or another and sometimes we you know have a bad day and it's fine it's expected so it's don't beat yourself too hard over mistakes that's important to remember now i feel good about not making a presentation fantastic uh. Right. Uh, I can I can provide. I have this exact exercise at the end here. I have another video on Indar about that. I can provide if if somebody and of course all of you are very very interested to watch it. I'll provide the link to you. You can also um, find more videos there on the channel about rules and uh, values and then uh, escort playstyle. There's a video about that. All right, with that, I think we'll uh, wrap up. I've been keeping you guys here for an hour and a half. I think that's more than enough. I I hope this is, uh, has been informative and uh, helps along the way for everyone involved. Thank you for coming. And uh, like I said, if you want to stay here and practice or uh, ask more questions or discuss other matters of uh, which gun is the best and which max is the most OP, I will also stay for a bit. So feel free to stick around. <laughs>